God's Word has to say to our lives. We'll be in Philippians chapter 4 this morning, starting in verse 1. If it's your uh, first time to Life Point and you don't have a Bible with you, we have a Bible uh, sitting in front of the pew. Uh, it's not a pew, the chairs in front of you, the chairs around you. Um, and, and if you need a Bible, there's one right there for you to use. Inside of it, there is a, a little Connect card for you to fill out if it's your first time. Just uh, do that and then put it in the offering plate when it passes by. And then you can actually keep this Bible. It's our free gift to you. Um, you can take that with you. In Philippians chapter 4, we're going to begin... In verse 1, it says, Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. I entreat Euodia and, and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, Whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable. If there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning. For those of you who are first-time guests, I am Jay Clatworthy, the senior custodian at Life Point Baptist Church. <laughs> Feels that way sometimes. But I'm grateful to be here with you this morning, and I greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I would encourage you to turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12 is where our text will be today. Um, but before we, we begin, I'd like to ask, have you ever been uh, somewhere and you, you start to get that feeling that you've forgotten something? You're in that circumstance, you know, maybe, maybe you're sitting in class and you remember, oh no, I didn't do that homework assignment. It changed life. Uh, or maybe you forgot one ingredient in something that you're going to bring to the potluck and you're thinking, uh-oh, how well, that's going to turn out. Gentlemen, maybe you've forgotten your anniversary date. I, I've thought several times that we should just make a t-shirt that says, I forgot my anniversary and she let me live. I would have to wear them, one. Um, maybe it was something a little bit more important for me. A couple years ago, uh, I think it was the first summer we were here actually, uh, we did volleyball on uh, Sunday nights, and we'll do that this year uh, as well, Lord willing. And uh, Sarah had, had, she was a little tired, so she said, you know, I'm going to take uh, all the kids except for Robbie. At that time, I think it was just Jason, Ellie, she took home. Now there's a whole bunch more. Um, five to be exact, just so you know, I, I know how many children I have. Um, and I was left with Robbie. Well, he went and played, and, and ab about an hour later, I'm riding in the car with Zach Pyle, and I just have this gnawing feeling. We're driving to go to, 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 to uh, Whataburger. Something's missing. My cell phone beeps, and I look down, and there's a picture of Robbie grinning ear to ear. I don't remember who sent it to me. There was something missing from... Life, and I just kind of got that feeling and then found out that I had forgotten my son. The 
The reason I ask that is I think that all too often the reasons that we worry as people is because we've forgotten some things. The reason that we tend to be tempted to worry is that we have forgotten. You say, well, what in the world have we forgotten? Well, I'm glad you asked, and we'll spend the rest of our time today talking about those things. Um, But I know that one of the great things about speaking on a subject like worry is the reality that I'm in a fellowship of uh, fellow strugglers this morning. I know that everyone, it's universal, all of us, have at one point or another uh, struggled with worry. Ultimately, there are two types of people when it comes to worry. Those of us who admit that it is a struggle not to worry, and then those of us who are willing to live our lives in an outright lie and say that we never worry. And you know, it's kind of funny, those people that try and, you know, stiff upper lip and no, no, I never worry, just I I cast all of my cares on on God the way that I should. I, I never have struggled with worry. The interesting thing about worry is when you try to bottle it up and keep it inside, it shows all over. You know, you're sitting there, what, what, is, there, is there something wrong with you? No, I'm fine. Why? Well, you know. You know, you've been around people like that. So we all certainly struggle with worry. Recently, uh, I, I personally, I was going through the week this week, and there's something that I had been worrying about sinfully, uh, for the past several weeks. And God took that particular issue and just turned it in a completely different direction. And one of my friends here uh, that I work alongside of said, I told you not to worry. I'm like, yeah, you and half of Scripture. Don't take it personal. (laughs) I'm just a great worrier. So that kind of led me down this path of of dealing with this particular passage of Scripture, this encouragement from our Lord not to worry. Luke chapter 12, starting in verse 22. Thank you, Dylan. Luke chapter 12, starting in verse 22. And he said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat nor about your body, what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? If then you are not able to do as small thing as this, as that, Why are you anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass, which is alive in the field today, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not seek what you are to eat, what you are to drink, nor be worried, For all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with treasure in in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your inerrant, inspired, infallible word. I thank you that you speak to sinners such as us this morning. I thank you for your written word. I I pray today as we, each one of us in our, our lives, struggle with worrying about different things, that we would learn to rest in who you are and what you promise, that we would remember the things that you have told us in your word all throughout this next week. I pray today that our hearts would be changed, not just that our heads would be filled, filled with knowledge, but ultimately that we would change in the way that we worry, in the way that we fret, and, and, and that we would live in light of hope, not in light of worry. In Jesus' name, amen. 
First thing, before I really get started in these verses, um, I want us just to think a little bit about when this particular text was written. Jesus was speaking to farmers and fishermen. They would have had to trade for their necessities. There would have been no sanitation, no health care programs. When there came a long-term drought in their time, they would simply die. There was not all of the modern conveniences uh, that we tend to... Um, to have and so uh, all the more they had reasons to worry in every generation there are reasons that we have to worry and the people that Jesus is speaking to particularly in this passage during the time that it was written certainly had reasons to worry and sometimes we think well, that ultimately what we can do as a society is we can cure our worry and we can cure all of our problems by being sophisticated, by growing in all of our technologies and our healthcare systems and our infrastructure. And when all of those things are put in their proper place and we get to there's this, this idea that we can build a utopian society and ultimately one day we won't have any problems, we won't have anything to worry about. But if we look at, over time, these believers who didn't have very much at all compared to what we have today, and what would you say the average person worries less or more than the people that this was written to? And I would encourage you that, in my opinion, probably more. Um, I know at least one that stands behind the pulpit probably is guilty of worrying more. Maybe you guys don't. Um, but we tend to worry more. I mean, think about it. Throughout our lifetime, if we're not careful, we grow in worry, not because of circumstance, but just because of the heart attitude that we have. Think about when you were a child and you thought, if only I had one more dollar allowance a week. Think of what I could do with that one dollar. And so you get the dollar. And then when you're a teenager, if only I could get a job to pay for this cell phone or this I can remember when I was 16 years old, I had a pickup truck. It had been totaled two times before I got it, and I thought it was like a Bentley. You know, this is the chariot of style, even though it's been crushed on both sides. I'm doing great to have this. My, you know, I've got this, and, and then I started to worry about, all right, how am I going to get the money to fix that, and how am I going to get the money to do this? How am I going to get money to put a radio in it? Singing to yourself with my voice doesn't work out well. And then you get to college and you, you say, well, I, will I land the job that I'm supposed to have? And then you land that first job and you say, will I have enough money to pay for everything my children need and to prepare for retirement? And then we get to retirement and we say, well, will I have enough in the bank account that I've set aside to pay for all my health costs and all my housing? You see, the reality is, is our worry isn't tied to our circumstance. Our, our worry is, is, is tied to the view that we have of who God is and what he's going to provide. We see that clearly in these scriptures. But ultimately, we do have abundant reasons to worry in this lifetime. There are all kinds of things that, that we worry about. Do I have real friends? What if I don't make the team? What if I forget my lines in the play? What if someone, there's one I can relate to. When I was in Bible college, what if I get in front of a church and I make a fool of myself sometimes? Been there, done that, got the t-shirt. It's not that bad. Um, you, you get over it. Um, what if someone else gets picked for a certain committee or a certain task? Will I ever find a husband or a wife? If I find one, will he or she be faithful? Will we be able to have kids? If we have kids, how will they turn out? What about my health? Some of my friends are dying of cancer. Is that going to be me? Will I have the strength to endure that? See, worry points its little beady finger at your relationships, your money, your achievements, your health. And ultimately, God is telling us throughout this passage that you worry not because of something that you necessarily want, not because of things, but you worry because you're concerned with you. You are the primary focus. Worry is, at the base level, it's self-centered. Remember the context of this passage earlier in Luke. Uh, just look at verse 20. 
for instance. Uh, Luke chapter 12, verse 20. But God said to them, Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things that you have prepared, whose will they be? Ultimately, what Christ is, is dealing with here is a parable of the rich fool who lived his life to amass great wealth, and so Christ is dealing with greed. And at the bottom of all of our worry is this covetous heart, this need for something that we think we have to have. And there, there's really two veins that, that, that greed moves in. One is that covetous greed. It says, I want more. I have to have and whatever, fill in the blank. We kind of talked about that in Sunday school this morning. Whatever you think you need more than God, I want this. And ultimately, you live a life where you will sin to get what you feel is necessary in your life. So covetous greed. The second is complacent greed. That's the kind of greed that has already gained everything that we think we need and says, look, I'm set. And it'll ultimately lead you in a direction of sinning because you'll be distracted by everything that you have to keep a hold of and not what Christ has called you to do in this world. You see, the amount of stuff that we have doesn't necessarily determine how we worry. But as we, our greedy hearts grab onto this world, they lead us in these paths of worry. And then we have to spend our time either capturing or keeping what we feel entitled to. Look at verse 34 in our text this morning. Jesus says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You see, greed forces that you take treasure from heaven and you push it to earth and you have to worry about it. Greed says, don't worry about eternity, worry about here and now, and keep hold of all the treasure that you have right here. And so you go about worrying. But the gospel restores our hope in the promises of God, and it kills our worry. When we remember the promises of God, when we remember what he has said, ultimately our worry goes away and our hope is restored because what we can trust about the gospel is that it is complete. So the gospel restores the promises of God. First look in verse 22 and 23. And he said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. What you will eat nor about your body what you will put on. For life is more than food and the body more than clothing. See, it's about a perspective that the gospel gives you. The promises of the gospel give us a godly perspective. God sees life differently than we do. Uh, we always think that what we have right in front of us is all that our life consists of. But as God looks at us, what we own is not what our life is about in God's eyes. Jesus reminds us, as Paul said, that we ultimately don't wrestle against flesh and blood, that our lives are about so much more than just having stuff. Namely, our life is about who has us, not what we have. God is giving you a command here not to be anxious. He invites you, trust in me. He sets you free from everything in this life that seeks to pull at your heart and make you worry. And this is the starting point where we can start to gain his perspective. He's saying, don't worry about all of these things. Have the perspective that I have. And then this gives us a direction to walk in from here. You see, Jesus isn't just wanting to give us a command of stop worrying. He wants to command us in that direction, but then he wants us to move in a better direction of understanding who he is and how we can relate to him. Look at verse 24. We see the sufficiency of God that the gospel restores, that gospel promises restore. Verse 24, consider the ra ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. How much more of more value are you than these birds? Here we see Christ encouraging us that God will provide us everything that we need. And if you think about it, ravens, they don't always get what they want, but they get what they need. And if you think about how birds have to kind of fly around and scavenge for things, they don't always get it in the most luxurious ways. But if we're honest, a lot of what we worry about is, am I get, gonna get what I want, not what I need? And am I gonna get it in a way that's comfortable, not in the way that God wants me to get it? 
At the bottom of worry is something in us that says our way of getting is better than God's way of giving. Ravens, uh, ultimately, they don't worry about what's ahead or what's behind. They live in the now. They trust in the, in the sufficiency of God. I don't know how many times in my personal life, in, 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 Sarah would say if there's an Olympic medal to give Jay, it's in worry. He takes the cake in, in that area. Amen? I don't know how many times we've been in a conversation and my mind is so focused, not on the now and the sufficiency of Christ, but all of the things that are ahead of us. And are we planning this out right? Are we doing that? Are we doing this? And I get this look. And it's just as if to say, how does your, does your mind ever stop? She said that to me a few times, actually. Have you ever just stopped and just live right now? We're fine, Right? Far too often we're tempted not to trust in the sufficiency of Christ. Ultimately, the question has to be asked in light of this, where do we find our security? Christ or our checkbook? Um, and there's so many other areas, but here's a test. When you balance your checkbook, when you do your, your, your finances, are there, are there ever, is there ever a temptation where you struggle with pride? Look at me, I've got all of this. And, and you have that, that content type greed. I've got, I've amassed lots of money, and so I'm doing very well. Or do you struggle in despair? My bank account just barely balances, so uh, God's not providing what I need. And you have that covetous, I need more before God will keep his promises. We need to learn to live in the sufficiency of Christ, knowing that he will provide everything that we need. Spurgeon said, Our anxiety does not empty tomorrow of its sorrows, but only empties today of its strength. If we would trust in the sufficiency of Christ, we would be reminded that the gospel, in the gospel, we have everything we need. We would do so much better not to worry. Christ is sufficient. God will give us everything we need. Secondly, look at verse 25 we see God's promise of his sovereignty verse 25 and which of you being anxious can add a single hour to his life span of life if then you are not able to do a small thing as this why are you anxious about the rest what God is saying what Christ is saying is look God is in control of every single moment of your life. There was a predetermined time when you would come into this world and there is a predetermined time when you will be taken out sets me free every time I hear some health, you know, infomercial that says I need to lose 15 pounds so that I live a longer life. I'm like, mm -mm, I'm going to trust in the sovereignty of God and keep eating fried chicken. That's not exactly good stewardship of your health, just so I'm clear. That's definitely taking that out of context. But I have rationalized that when I'm at KFC today. Sinfully. The Bible constantly talks about life as a walk. Jesus is saying, look, you can't add even a single step to your life. Stop worrying about it. Last night we had a really interesting experience as a family. I'm, I'm sitting in my chair reading over some Sunday school lessons and some other things for this, this morning, and I hear Robbie scream from upstairs, I don't want to die. And I'm thinking, uh-oh, he ticked his mom off again. So I decided I'd go watch. Um, good entertainment. And I got up there and she was just comforting him. He really was concerned. I don't, I don't want to die. It was in Robbie's, in his young life, I think the first time that the reality that we're all going to die hit that that includes Robbie. You know, it wasn't really much to worry about until it came home to roost in his life. But then he was concerned, and I, I, I thought about the text that I would preach this morning, and, and, and I, I said, Robbie, can, can you come downstairs and let's just talk about this? It, in, in my head, I just thought this is a, a golden opportunity to teach my son about the sovereignty of God, that he is good and that he has a plan for Robbie's life and that Robbie doesn't need to worry. And so we read these verses together, and and I asked Robbie a question right now. We're going through a, a system of, I ask him a question and he memorizes a response. And the question was, Robbie, remember our first question. What is our only hope in life and death? And his response that we are not our own, but belong both body and soul in life and death to our Savior, 
the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as we sat there on the steps, I said, so, so Robbie, if you belong, think about this, if you belong to Jesus and you are his possession and he treasures you, do you think that he's gonna lose you? And Robbie looked up and said, yeah. <laughs> okay, let's back up. And so I said, Robbie, what's your favorite toy? He said, it's a transformer. I said, okay, transformers are cool. Um, what if I went out tonight and I bought you the best transformer? As your father, I gave you the best transformer that Toys R Us, Mattel, whoever could, could make. Would you do everything that you could to keep, on, to keep hold of it? And he said, yeah, I, I would make sure that I wouldn't lose it. And I said, but here's the difference between you and God. You don't have complete control. You're not completely sovereign over everything. God is. He has purpose to keep a hold of you. So no matter what, not even death, can separate you from God. Do you understand that? And he said, yeah, I get it. And we prayed together. I was so grateful for an opportunity to show my son as he struggles at a very young age that God is sovereign, that our only hope in life and death is that we are not our own but belong to God. You see, the problem, I think, in worrying is that as Americans, we've started to believe something completely different, and that is that we are not God's but that we are our own that we belong to us, that we are sovereign in ourselves, that we have control over everything. And I thank God in my own life that in God's sovereignty, he teaches me, <laughs> you're not in control. That sets me free to be able to love and to serve him instead of worrying. So we see God's sovereignty. Look at verse 27 through 28. We see God pointing to his glory. Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass, which is alive, to, alive in the field today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried." So we see there's a concern in the heart of a worrier that we, we're seeking after glory. We are constantly doing this. We are natural-born glory seekers. Some of you have met the natural-born glory hogs. I'm not talking about them, but each one of us have sought to have glory. We, we seek glory in our appearances. How many magazines set at the, the checkout line at the supermarket? They're all about glory about having the perfect body and the perfect hairdo and the perfect makeup so that people will appreciate our appearances. We roll out the red carpet, and I think Joan Rivers is dead now, but she would comment on everybody's dress and what they were wearing and all of this stuff, and I know people that enjoy watching all of that stuff, and I'm like, how can you stand what, listening to this for five minutes? Who cares what kind of pants that dude has on? That's a type of glory seeking we want to be the most beautiful or academic pursuits we have people that study i love to study we want the most knowledge or guys we some of you i can't be guilty of this but some of you spend a lot of time in the gym because we want to be most powerful or we want the, the, uh, to reach our vocational goals. We want to provide or to be the best leader. We want relational glory. We want to be the most loved. All too often that love comes here. We're concerned more about that. What we need to see here is Jesus is saying that God is going to glorify you ultimately because of what he has done, not because of anything that you do. God glorifies you because of what he's done, not because of you. And all of these, these things that we tend to do in our lives to get glory for ourselves are pointless. In the span of our life, we could spend all of our energy, we could be the, the, the biggest and best and brightest thing that this planet has ever seen in the eyes of men. And ultimately, Jesus says, be careful because you could lose your entire soul. But we spend so much effort trying to seek glory in our own way. But God will clothe you, Jesus says, in nothing less than his perfect glory. 
You will be radiant. You will be indestructible. You will be full and reflecting of God's glory. But worry tries to creep in and say, look, you're never going to be glorified enough. You're never going to be good enough. You're never going to attain this goal. People aren't going to like you. Whatever the whisper of worry is in your life, it's, at some level, it has to do generally with your glory. But the gospel says, I never had glory to begin with. Jesus does. And so I'll just reflect the glory that he gives. And again, it's ultimately glory because of what Christ has done, not because of what we do. The Bible says even the best works that we have were, pre were prepared before the world was even established that we might walk in them. The best thing that I can do as a Christian is something that God ultimately ordained at the beginning of time. And if I do anything good in the sight of God, it is because God is working a heart and a life out that would glorify him in that way. I'm only reflecting the glory of God. I don't need to worry. One day, that glorification will be perfected and complete when I stand before him in heaven. I don't need to worry about my clothing. I don't need to worry about my own glory. And look in verses 30 and 31. We see God's preeminence in all things. The promise of his preeminence. Preeminence simply means that God is before all things. And for the life of the Christian, members of Life Point Baptist Church, the question that I would have for you today as you struggle and worry is, are you putting God first in all things in your life? He will always be, by very, his very nature, before all things. But as you make choices in your daily life, are you seeking to put Christ first in all things? Are you putting the priority where it needs to be in God and God alone? God says, look at all the things your greedy little heart is after. And remember that when you seek after all of these things, you're just like the rest of the world. Stop and think when you worry about something and remember how much you look like the world and how less you look like a believer when you're in that path. And ultimately, it's generally because we're putting Christ at the bottom of our list. Worry is an accusation in our hearts that we know what we need more than God does. Look at what uh, verse 30 says. For all the nations of the world seek after these things and your Father knows that you need them. God knows exactly what you need. We, we talked about in our Sunday school class this morning how wonderful it is, the reality that we can be set free to know that God knows what I need. I only know what I want. God knows everything that I need to take the next step in my life. But I tend to be so worried and frustrated about the things that I think I need. Only God knows what I really, really need. Do need So do we put Christ before all things? What we need is ultimately not something, but someone. It's Christ. It's salvation. It's, it's having a relationship with Jesus. Again, it's putting Christ first in every area of our life. You know, I, the thing that scares me in a lot of local New Testament supposed Bible-believing churches today is that we teach people to pray a prayer and they walk around and they say they know Jesus, but they put him last in their life. And Jesus says in Revelation that there will come a time when he will say, he will look at people who say, look at all of the things that we've done for you. Look at everything that we've done in your name. And what is Jesus going to say to them? Depart from me. I never knew you. One of the most scary statements in all of Scripture. And the real question isn't just, do you know Jesus, but does Jesus know you? Have you put him first in every area of your life? Vocationally, with your spouse, with your children, with your bank account? Is God before all things? And generally, if you're, if you're consumed with worry, you'll find places where you haven't put Christ first. Is he preeminent in all things in your life? And then we hear Jesus' encouragement. He uses this, this phrase, little flock. He's, he's being loving in this context here. He says, fear not, little flock. One of the best statements in all of Scripture, in my opinion. 
Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no, one, no moth destroys. It is your Father's good pleasure, believer, to give you himself. God is in all of your worries and all of your struggles and all of the seeking after glory and putting other things first and believing that, that, that this world is sufficient, not God, and believing that this world is out of God's control. All of those things that cause our worry, worry God shows up and says, trust me, and you can have me. You can have a relationship with me. You have nothing to worry about. You see, the, uh, the picture to me, when Jesus says, it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, that next verse that talks about now you can sell everything that you have. I think about it. If somebody showed up, if the Queen of England walked in here today and I lived in a trailer park and she said, I'm going to give you Buckingham Palace, would I fret and worry about anything that I had left in that trailer? I would say, out of here. See you at Buckingham, people. <laughs> and the point isn't about what we have here. It's that we have a kingdom established in heaven that is secure. And when we know that we have been given the kingdom of heaven, it makes us let go of everything here. And we have nothing to worry about because God is establishing his kingdom. So all of the work that I'm doing to establish my little kingdom here seems trite and meaningless. And I don't have to worry anymore. But far too often in the life of a believer, in my life, the reason that I struggle, the reason that I worry, the reason that Jesus is saying, remember, it's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom is because my heart is so attached to building my little shack on earth. And just so we're clear, you can have a huge house and still be impoverished. There's some people that that analogy about a trailer park is gonna throw them off. I totally believe in my heart of hearts that somebody can live in a trailer and have a way better life than somebody that lives in a palace. It's dependent on what they're holding on to. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for today. We thank you for the encouragement, the reality that you are sovereign, that you are sufficient, that you will glorify us. God, that, that you are before all things and that in this life, in the life of this church, we have nothing to worry about because you are ordaining things, orchestrating things all the time that will achieve the purpose that you have set us here to achieve. And ultimately one day, we will understand the reality of what it means that you have given us the kingdom. Because we will stand before you, we will see you for who you are, and all of the things in this life that we tend to worry about, we tend to fret over, and we tend to allow to own our hearts will simply melt away. And so today as we sing, I pray that you would work in hearts and lives. I pray that you would um, draw those to your, yourself um, who might not know you today, Lord. And God, I pray that throughout this week we would constantly be encouraged in our hearts and our lives that we don't have anything to worry about, that you take care of your children, that you are not a father that walks away, but ultimately our only hope in life and death is that we are not our own, but that we belong to you. And because we belong to you, our worry can leave. In Jesus' name, amen. You stand as we sing. However God has dealt with your heart this morning, maybe you need to just come and give some of your worries over to him. Maybe you need to come and join in our local church and seek encouragement in your worry. Maybe you need to come and accept him. Maybe you need to trade in all of the worries of this life, all of the things that, that own your heart and allow the good king, the righteous judge, to rule and to reign in your life. However God is leading in your heart today, as we sing, you come. Singing how marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall end.
a sinner condemned unclean. Singing how marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall This time I would ask that our ushers come forward as we take up our offering. And as they make their way forward, I'd just like to encourage you, you saw the video this morning um, about Psalms and the series that we will be getting on June the 19th uh, in, our, in our evening service. Um, and there are psalm books that will be uh, for sale as we go through this series. They are just the book of Psalms, uh, not the entire word of God, but just the book of Psalms in the ESV. Um, and so if you want to buy one of those, see Linda Smith um, after the service or this evening. Each one of those will be uh, $15 a piece. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for all of your provision in our lives. We thank you that you are a father who knows everything that we need. That there is nothing that escapes your view. And Father, that you have brought us exactly to the place in our lives that you want, that you might use us the way that you want. And so today, I just pray that as we give, that our understanding of, of your provision in our lives, of your willingness 